Britain are some of the finest gardens anywhere in the world. For me, it's about getting in amongst the wonderful plants that flourish in this country and sharing the passion of the people who tend them. However, there is another way to enjoy a garden. And that's to get up above it. I love ballooning because you get to see the world below in a whole new light. From up here, you get a real sense of how the garden sits in the landscape, how the terrain and the climate has shaped it. And I want you to share that experience with me. Today, I'm in Mid Wales, and from up here, it's utterly breathtaking. I'm getting a top notch view of the Welsh county of Powys, which borders England on one side and lies in the shadow of the mountains of Mid Wales on the other. It's only when you get over to the eastern edge of Wales, where England meets the Welsh marshes, that you start to see habitation and, of course, glorious gardens. I'm visiting two gardens that are old favourites, one I first encountered 40 years ago. Are you implying I'm a wimp? <laughs> no, no. Oh, I can manage this. <laughs> <laughs> and the other which belonged to a friend who turned this valley into a verdant garden, the Dingle. I reckon Bobby went over there, looked at the hillside, and thought, I'm going to put something in there and I'm going to smear the colour through into here. I'll be meeting someone with a century-long relationship with one of our gardens. It's just... So, so peaceful. Do you know, I couldn't agree more mm. with you. Wales is best known for its rugged mountains rather than its gardens. And down below me, down there, right there, is Powys Castle. And a view I have never seen before. I can see the immense size of the drum tower. And I've never seen the central court like that. I've walked through, but from up here, it's massive. I can see the straight lines of the Italian terrace. It's flipping vast. And look at those views! Look at them! Amazing! They're the very things that bring me to Paris. And look at them sitting on that edge, on that terrace. The size, just incredible. And I now can't wait to get down there. Absolutely beautiful. Powys is Welsh through and through, built by Welsh princes only years before the English conquered the country. Over the course of 800 years, the original tower has changed from a medieval fortress to a world-famous stately home and a hundred acres of gardens and parkland. A mile from Welshpool, Powys sits on the eastern fringe of the foothills of the Mid Wales mountain range. A great pink granite castle erupting out of a hill. Organic hues cascading and flowing down the hillside to beautifully planted Italianate terraces with plantsmanship that you won't see all over the world.
Built on a hill, its vantage points once allowed Powys to spot marauding English armies on the plains below. Today, the steep slope down to the formal garden is one of its key features. And the man with the enviable job of keeping it all in immaculate condition is head gardener David Swanton, who could do with a hand with his sweet peas. Hi, David. Hi, Christine. <laughs> Hi, nice to see nice you. Nice to meet you. Yeah, now he's an important summer job, isn't it? That's right, we'll keep deadheading them and uh, keep them flowering away for the season. Yeah, but you see, people don't do it, do they? And I don't know why, because it's so relaxing. I love doing this it's job. It's a great little job, isn't it? Well, first yeah. thing in the morning, last thing at night. To keep both roses and sweet peas in flower, you've just got to deadhead them, and it's simple. All you do is chop the flipping flowers off. Yeah. But, I mean, it must take quite a bit of time for you to do this. We usually yeah. have volunteers that help us with this one, to be honest. Well, and it's such a nice job for the volunteer, isn't it? And yeah. so rewarding, because to see him, you know, in bloom and just uh -huh. keep blooming is fantastic. Tell me, how, how did you get into gardening? I always enjoyed gardening when I used to live in Warrington with me, growing up with me, mum and dad, and I had quite a modest garden. So when I left school, I did a YTS scheme with the Borough Council in Warrington. Oh, YTS. That's it. YTS scheme was interesting, wasn't it, youth training scheme? Because a lot of gardeners came in that way. There, that's right. That was uh, the way in back then, really. It's a good way as well. It's not just flowers that have drawn me to Powys. I first came here mm -hmm. in 1973. Right, right. From college. Uh -huh. And our lecturer had been wittering on for ages about these fantastic yews. Mm. And I kept thinking, what's he wittering on about yew trees? Uh -huh. You know, they just grow, they're, they're dull and they're boring. And, I said to my mum and dad, come on, I want to go to that castle garden. I couldn't yeah. remember it's there. I said, but they've got big yew trees, apparently. And when I came in, it was like Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. I couldn't believe the size, but just the froth, the... and cascade down the, you know, the terraces. And, I mean, just look, there is something about that structure, that foaming, organic, bubbling mass of green mm. that's just amazing. But, I mean, I know that they're quite magical underneath, so I think, come You're on, let's go, and have, let's go and have a look okay. at them monsters. So, I mean, just <laughs> absolutely fantastic things. Ancient ewes have many stories to tell as a number of rings in their trunks. Powys ewes were a little over 300 years old and were planted as fashionable topiary in the Brock Garden that was first to be laid out here. Ewes are an evergreen tree that's truly hardy and very easy to grow, perfect for those early gardeners finding their way around plants and the British climate. If you're into topiary, then ewe is perfect. If you get it wrong, clip it too hard, the U is very forgiving, offering up lots of growth to try again. And it's a great hedge too, dense and woody if kept in shape. But if you let it get away from you, then these majestic shapes are what you could end up with. Yews are often associated with gloomy churchyards, but I love their design potential and they always bring out my inner spirit. Let's have a look in here. Look at the... Oh. You see, the veins, the arteries, surging water all the way up the solid top. Look! Mm. I mean, oh. Isn't it magical? I mean, 300 years. The skeleton, the power that's there. How on earth do you look after them? Very good question. Traditionally, very, very long ladders. There's a picture out from there, early 1900s, and the ladders propped up with bricks on the corner to compensate for the slope. There's a guy actually stood on the top and they were using sickles. Scythes? Yeah. Scythes, yeah. Scythes and hand sickles. Now, because we, we don't use ladders anymore, we've got a small cherry picker, got about a metre footprint and a 14 metre reach. 14 metres? That's it. Yeah. Yeah, gods. So, 14 metres up there, looking down there... It's about a 30 metre drop in places well, and the, the higher bit, yeah. 
really bouncy. You need a good head for right on that fella. I can say, you need to know what you're doing up top of there. Mm -hmm. That's it. Uh, How do you get the shape? How do you maintain the shape? Well, the shape, if you look in here, you can see they're actually trees that's evolved. So yeah. when they got left to go from the topiaries, they let them go into trees. Right. And then in Victorian times, they were clipped over. So right. uh, you get these fantastic shapes and living sculptures. In their youth, the ewes were clipped into geometric shapes, but as Torpery went out of fashion, they were allowed to revert into trees until Powys's Victorian gardeners tamed them once again. Some of these limbs are enormous. You must get them coming down and tearing, don't you? Hopefully not. So uh, we try and stop a bit of that. Yeah. So we've got uh, braces on. Okay. So some of the branches there. That's like belts to and braces. It. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And we'll also use these fellas. We've got some good old props here oh, to uh, right. prop the branch up and obviously fill the gap out below. So uh, should you have a go popping this one in? Aye, right, come on then. I come think on. we might need our young man Daniel. Dan, you need help here, mate? Are you implying I'm a wimp? <laughs> no, no. Dan, Dan's pride and joy cutting these edges. He's Come a man on, look, in look, 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 I can manage this. <laughs> <laughs> now, which one are we propping then? Which We're one going needs to this one. a bit of and, support? Uh, he's just leaning down on all the others. OK, so where do you want me? That's a good question for Steve. <laughs> so, Come on, anywhere I'll get where you can push, you get in there. Then. Hang on. Come on, let me get down here. Go on, push right, go on. One, two, three. Up, oh, she goes. A bit more. Oh, beautiful. Is she all right? Yeah. Do you beautiful. have to check outside? To see that you've got it right. We'll have a look and make sure he's uh, filled it nicely, yeah. Right. Yeah, not overhanging the other branches. Right. It's like a crutch when you've broken your leg. <laughs> Prop yourself up, lad. <laughs> God. So, 300 years, we loved and looked after and propped up. Written in the gardens at Powys is over 300 years of gardening history. The terraces were hewn from granite of the late 1600, following the new Italian fashions arriving in northern Europe. There were water gardens which have since been lost, and 100 acres of extensive woody parks, as one noble traveller described them in the late 18th century. But it was another 100 years before a new chatelaine of Powys Castle fell in love with the landscape replanted the terraces and turned the medieval plains into a spectacular rose garden. Violet Herbert, Countess of Powys, was the driving force behind the reincarnation of this fabulous landscape. So what are we going to be doing here? Oh, well, couldn't have you spraying the roses, Christine. It's a motorised right. sprayer, none of your knapsack digging into your hey, shoulders with us. This is better, isn't it? I mean, oh, gone are the brilliant. old days of the knapsack and, and raw overseas. shoulders and... Oh, right. Yeah. So what, what's in the tank mix? It's a product that contains garlic and seaweed mixture. OK. Oh, that's going to encourage really good growth and uh, help keep the diseases down. Natural pesticides are gaining popularity and can target specific problems. It does whiff a bit, though. It does. It does smell, so I don't know if visitors will think when they come to uh, see what scent the rose has got. This, uh, no, all it's scented day. roses. <laughs> so how did Violet influence the garden? Well, Violet was keen to take on the garden and convinced her husband George to let her do so. So her ambition to us to make it one of the best in Britain, if not the world. Wow, so she uh, did a good job of that, didn't she? Exactly. Violet had been married to George, fourth Earl of Powys, for 20 years before she asked him if she could take over the management of the deteriorating gardens at their castle estate. An Edwardian lady taken on a project of this size, that tells me a lot about Violet. Some elms that obscured the old kitchen garden glass houses were destroyed in a gale. Lady Violet didn't care to see anything so unsightly, so decided to clear the area and create a new formal garden in their wake. I think she achieved her ambition to make Powys one of the most beautiful gardens in Wales and England. But what a tall order it is to keep it just the way her ladyship would like, particularly the Rose Garden. 
How often would you be doing this job? You're looking at spraying with that about every seven to ten days, they recommend. Uh, slightly more than the chemical, but obviously easier because you've not got a kit up and you yeah. can do it at different times of the day. I mean, I reckon they're hard work, all this spraying and stuff. They are hard work, so you've got quite a lot of time uh, spent pruning, deadheading, um, spraying and feeding. But uh, we decided if we're going to grow, we're going to grow really well, so uh, this is helping us achieve that. Oh, I think you're doing a grand job. Just like the domestic staff indoors at Grand Houses, the outdoor staff also had a strict pecking order, with head gardener, undergardeners and a team of men working with each. David Evans is a volunteer at Poe's and has family memories of the gardening hierarchy at the castle. My great-grandfather was um, working in the gardens as a general gardener. We took my grandfather there as about 13 or 14 when he left school. They called him the Border Boy, um, and they were small in stature and, of course, able to go into the borders and weed at the back, which were sometimes inaccessible to the, the adult gardeners. And he was there until, until he was 70 in 1937. It was a job for life. David's own father also worked at Powys. As a single young man, he lived with all the other young gardeners in the Boffey, their communal accommodation. And the lads had um, a high old time there, really. It was uh, all boys together. And, of course, they had their own cricket team as well, which my father thoroughly enjoyed. The war came and the Bothy ceased. But a really beautiful building, I personally think. Once David was born, his father introduced him to Powys and the fourth generation began a relationship with the garden. My abiding memories are, of course, going up there on a Sunday to make sure that um, the boilers were stoked in the gardens because they grew peach trees there. And, of course, they had to have heat and sitting in the fountain garden, father and the then head gardener, Mr Andrews, what he'd done or what was needed doing. And Mrs Andrews, although it was wartime and we were very, very short of all the things that you had, uh, would make um, fudge. And I'm afraid I've been addicted to fudge ever since. David didn't follow in his father's gardening footsteps, but the Evanses still remain part of Powys. David is a house volunteer and revels in his job. Hello, David. Nice to meet you. Hello. How nice to meet you. Do you think the people of Welsh people are mm. proud of Powys Castle and its gardens? Yes. On the whole, Welsh Pudlians are very proud of Powys. I'm very proud of the gardens. What about you? It means a great deal. It was always a magical place to me. So when did you come to Paris and I start came volunteering? 17 years ago, I came to buy some tickets <laughs> for a concert. <laughs> and the uh, house curator said to me, well, have you ever thought of uh, coming as a volunteer? And I thought, well, if I'm not a volunteer, I'll have to pay to go around there. I'm being a Welshman, I don't like spending well, money don't too like often. Part in it, yeah. No, <laughs> and you just keep coming and you just keep coming. One of the things that thrills me the most is down in the fountain garden, just sitting and listening to the waters. And this is the sort of place to come to where you can just sit back and relax and enjoy these beautiful gardens and all that goes with it on a beautiful day like today. It's just so, so peaceful. Do you know, I couldn't agree more with mm. you. The gardens are unique. I think David and his family are another thread in Paris's long history as integral to the place as its aristocratic owners and equally worthy of lasting recognition.
From up here, Howis looks like a jewel of cultivation sat amongst wooded, forested hillsides. And it's the land down there that fed the nation during the Second World War. Forty years after Lady Violet had taken over at Powys, war broke out and all the agricultural land was put into intensive farming to feed the nation. Overnight, women gardeners like Lady Violet were replaced by land army girls, an army of young women working in the land in place of the men who were now away fighting. Mona Holloway was a land army girl during the war, working on a farm close to the Powys estate. Sadly, Mona's too frail to tell her own tale, but her daughter, Jane Dowell, who grew up on a local farm, knows all of Mum's stories. She came from a farming background originally. She trained at Lisfassie Farming College, and then, um, of course, war broke out, and so the, the, any uh, possible um, girls that could work on the farms were recruited into the land army. The women took the role of men, basically, and had a very hard life. You know, they used to get up at the crack of dawn and go to bed when it was dark through harvest time. She had lots of different experiences. But the, the everlasting thing that has come out of Mum's days in the Land Army was actually meeting my dad. He lived in a farm about a mile away as the crow flies. And so he was the biggest part of her life to come out of it all. Uh, lots of happy memories, but also a very happy life with him. Brother and sister, Bob and Elizabeth, were children on the farm when they were witness to Mona's courtship with Jane's father, Herbert. They'd work jolly hard, wouldn't they? Yeah, long days. Yeah, because they'd milk first and then come into breakfast, and Mum would have bacon and egg all ready. Mona worked on the Joneses' farm with Nancy, a fellow Land Army girl. We were so lucky because Mona and Nancy, they were two lovely people and they just treated us, uh, they were treated as the family because they were living in, and they, they treated us as, as family, and we were very lucky. I think probably the thing that uh, I realised about Mona and uh, the land girls, what, what they were doing, was the sheer physical uh, size of the work. They just kept working hard all the year round. There was always something tough to do, you know, whether it was hoeing swedes or picking stones, it was tough going all the time. There was no quarter given for being female doing a man's job, but they were paid one pound a week, and that allowed them to enjoy occasional nights out. At the end of their day, which would have been heavy and long, I can remember them going to the bathroom and sanding their legs with uh, dry sand and he, uh, each one of them then would draw a line up the back of their leg and uh, <laughs> before they went get on their bikes to cycle 12 miles for the nearest dance and uh, uh, just time out from hard work all day. Hi, Hi both of you. Hi, Hi Jane. Nice to see you again. Good to see you. Growing up in the local area, Jane has kept in touch with the family where her mum was a Land Army girl. I was talking to mum about you the other day. She was talking about the two little children at Llanobin. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> a little bit older. That's right, yeah. <laughs> no wiser. Do you realise, Jane, that these are the fields you're looking at where mum and dad would meet on a Sunday afternoon? They walked down to meet each other and probably go into the woods mm. to canoodle. Oh, sure right. say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a new story to me. I've known that, that one before. And yet, I suppose it shouldn't surprise me because no. the farm's dad's home Jane. farm is so close to that's right. the Nobbins. Well, we were very happy for them that they should mm. meet like that because it was they were a, a love match, weren't they, for each other? Mm. They really were. In her official uniform, Mona was quite a catch for a young farmer looking for a wife. She's never sort of um, boasted or talked a lot about the work that she did. And I think talking to friends now about her land army days makes you realise how important a role she played. 
I am really very, very proud of her. A few miles north of Powys is another inspirational garden, the brainchild of an ex-Land Army girl, Barbara Joseph. It's a garden that shows what can be done with a site that is rugged, steep, and not one where you'd expect to find a garden. But Barbara Joseph took plants and painted the landscape, creating a magnificent picture connected by two lakes a beautiful garden by a lady that wasn't a trained horticulturalist. This is the Dingle, four acres of valley garden near Welshpool. I knew Barbara Joseph. She came from a privileged background a Cambridge graduate and a woman who fell in love and turned her back on all of that to marry Roy. And they lived here at the Dingle. Neither Barbara nor Roy were gardeners to start with. Roy was a farmer and Barbara learned on the job. She started planting on the banks in the 1950s and once she started, she couldn't stop. She designed a garden that gives a year-round kaleidoscope of colour, which, as I well know, takes a lot of skill to achieve. Barbara's grandson, Duncan Hamer, now lives here. Hi, Duncan. How are Hello, you? Oh, hi. Is the aunt? Oh, oh, thank you. Come. Thank you. So, so what are you up to? Uh, well, we're hoping to clear a little bit of an area over the water to make a little bit of a boat launch. OK. Well, well it has got rather overgrown, hasn't it, really? Yes, a little bit, yes. Is it? S sneaked up on us. I remember coming down these steps and you had a glorious view across there, Silver Eliagnus, a blue hydrangea, beautiful Acer. And this, I mean, it's not really fulfilling any purpose, is it? I think if you prune some of that out, and it may be a case of taking it all out, but if you take certainly half of it out, yeah. and then have a look what the contorted willow's doing, um, I think that'd be good, because it is a glorious view. And in the yeah. autumn, the silver and the blue and the intense, calming red mm. of that Acer. I mean, whoa! Nice, yeah. And I think you're missing the trick. No, I think you're right. It's interesting. It just sort of grows up on you. So, we'll, uh, should we give it a go and try yeah. and get them out? Yeah, come on, let's. You'll end up in the drink, you know, before long, if you're not I hope, careful. I, hope not. I can see it coming. Let's see if we can keep yeah. dry. <laughs> but, no, I often think of Barbie, and I think of the Dingle quite often, because it is that passion that amateurs can bring to gardening. overcome this site because you know as an untrained horticulturalist a valley with really lousy soil horrible rocks and rubble in it how on earth did she go about doing I, it well i think it's quite there's two things that i do know was um hard work yeah and then i think we're quite interesting ground here in that we're about 600 odd feet above sea level yeah south facing <laughs> behind us right and um it's challenging so yeah good ground prep working the ground hard and just thinking about overplanting and protecting from frost. Barbie knew her soil and knowing what would survive where, she emblazoned this valley with colour like this beauty. The smoke bush loves clayey soil as long as it's well drained, like on these hillsides. It's a large shrub growing anything up to seven metres with a spreading canopy. It has green or purple leaves and a wonderful display of fluffy flower heads in summer, followed by vibrant autumn colour. 
planting them where she did, Barbie shows her artistic and horticultural flair in one delightful shrub. What really puts the wind up me is the informed amateur, because they can be awesome. Yeah. And yet, you know, us horticulturalists, pompous blats that we are, often think that we're the only people who can do it. And there are several gardens around the country that are so spectacular that they haven't had any training, mm. but they've got that eye, and it's almost like a painter. I reckon Bobby went over there, looked at the hillside, and thought, I'm going to put something in there, and I'm going to smear the colour through into here, and I'm then going to contrast the shape, and I'm going to bring a bit of drama in with something dramatic there. And it was all in there waiting for her. And over the years, she's created a stunningly beautiful Mid Wales Valley. The use of water, the reflections. I mean, it's a beautiful garden, but come on, stop gassing. Well, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to say, Barbie, you'd be pleased to hear you saying that because she colour themed everything. Well, she certainly knew what she was up to. And I think what's quite interesting is that they're not, they're not traditional planting types, you know. She puts oh, no. stuff which doesn't go in traditional garden yeah. schemes. So, what I try and do when I'm replanting is stick to the colour themes. Okay. So, that's the key thing, really. Right. Is yeah. I don't, it's not a memorial, so we don't yeah. replant like we like, yeah. but we try and stick to both texture and colour okay. as it would have been, you know, yeah, so that's yeah. the key thing. Well, I have to say, I take my hat off to you. <laughs> well... I think it's a heck of a challenge. It's a nice challenge to have, that's the way I look yeah. at it. Well, I think you but... should come out, cos I want to show you what it's looking at. You want a hand? Oh, I'm OK, thanks. You're all right, yeah, cos I think we need to have a look, and I think it's now where it is on. You see, already you can see more of that colour. See how yeah. the hydrangea... Look at the beautiful reflections you're getting now. Yeah. You've got the reflections of the hydrangea causing a quite a nice dome, and then you've got the magic twinkling of silver in the water. It's beautiful. I think you're going to find you've got a bit of Barbie magic back. What gardens like this need is somewhere to relax and savour the view, to soak up the garden scents. David Evans loves his spot at Powys in the formal garden, and I'd love to encourage future generations to sit and absorb Powys too. What's needed is someone who adores this landscape and uses it to inspire his artwork. Someone like local craftsman Barry Davies. I've been asked to make a new bench with an inscription on the uh, on the top rail for um, David Evans and the gardeners that have been at Powers Castle. Um, and I thoroughly enjoy doing it. And it's a um, good, sturdy bench. I made it exactly to an original design, which I think is the wise thing to do. It's more in keeping with the history of Powers Castle and the gardens, really. It's such a fantastic place. And, you know, it's, it's just little touches like that 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 keep, every, keep everything together, and it's all in, in keeping together, really. Whenever I go into my workshop, I always look at the surrounding countryside, which never fails to stimulate me into getting on my work. So I'm most fortunate to be able to live and work in such a beautiful area. It's so inspiring, but the interest is always there. Uh, you never get bored of it. You never stop looking across the fields, um, across the hills, the way the leaves unfold in the, in the spring. You get a real sense of the seasons. How could I not be inspired by living in such a beautiful area? Indeed a bit of true craftsmanship to match Lady Violet's Edwardian plantsmanship. It'll sit well in the castle's formal gardens. Beautiful surroundings have always calmed the soul. It's something that community therapy gardens are discovering. Pontathrin in Mid Wales helps volunteers with health issues to get back on their feet through gardening. Pontathrin's manager is Nicky Morris. 
people might come in in distress. They need just to get away so they can come down here. They can actually go and stand on our little fishing pontoon here and just take stock. The garden is really, really important for that. Pontafrin's a small garden, but hugely beneficial to its members. This area is the bottom tier of the garden. As you can see, we've got a circular biodiversity walk that the volunteers made. Every single thing that you see in this garden has actually been made by our volunteers and by our members. Everything's recycled, nothing is ever gone to waste. The charity has been going since 1992, and one of its current long-term volunteers is Jan Rogers. I was up running one night, and um, I was attacked, assaulted, and I think that's when sort of hell opened its doors for the first time. So it was, uh, and from then it changed everything. It was the end, basically, of, of life as I knew it. I didn't see any way out of it. The garden is, to sum it up, a lifeline. It allows me to be outside, but it also allows me to be feeling safe outside, which is a huge issue. It gives you that confidence in yourself and confidence to help other people. And it puts back a sort of self-worth as well. I think the other thing is that I gained the qualifications. We actually completed a diploma, which is amazing because I certainly wouldn't have gone to college to do it. Angela has a condition that used to keep her housebound. I have fibromyalgia, which is a nerve damage and the pain uh, moves around the body. If I get stressed, then the pain becomes chronic and then I'm not able to, to do very much at all. I've been a hundred times better in myself since I've had this little bit of exercise and the fresh air. I just love being outdoors and uh, I love my friends. It's a place where people can come and be supported and feel safe. There's a lot of peer support goes on here, people just talking, discussing any of the issues, any of the feelings that they're having, that are worrying them or surrounding them about their mental health issues. And it's just a beautiful place to just to lose themselves and actually relax. It's a real community where people of all ages come together. I love being here. A small dish of strawberries or a, a big bucket full of new potatoes and we share a bit of food together. Um, I think he's uh, the top of the list on that well-being. The fact that we can all sit down and have some food that's come from the garden and uh, members have joined in producing that to put it together just to share. good to come here and actually help out and have a laugh with a few friends whilst growing things for everyone's week. Yeah, yeah, what I've got. <laughs> There's no pressure and members come and go as their condition dictates. By coming to Pond Havrin, it was a start of almost accepting who I am now. It was like I was existing, not living. And now, with the garden, I feel like I'm living and not existing. And it's, 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 it's a big change, and it's, it's absolutely brilliant. That's what gardening does for the soul. Lady Violet knew it, the Land Army girl sensed it, and I know that Barbie Joseph felt it to a very depth. Gardens need nurturing, and when they're as big as powies, it takes an army of gardeners to maintain their beauty. 
Every one of these people deserves lasting recognition. And I've got just the thing for the team at Powys. Well, it's nice to see so many of you gathered here, yeah. all you gardeners, because historically, that Bothy used to house gardeners, you know. It was where you all lived and had great fun. And fascinatingly, David, you mentioned your father lived in the Bothy, didn't he? He did indeed for a number of years. And um, he had a high old time, as they did. There's all these rich stories associated with Bothy, with this area in particular, and all of you give so much. I thought it would be really nice just to acknowledge your family of gardeners, this generation of gardeners, because they are special people. Very much so. And they give so much, not only to the garden, but the people visiting. The interesting thing is that when most of us come, we like to actually sit and stare and be reflective. And as a token, David, for you and all the volunteers, and just to say thank you, we thought that we might like you to be able to come and enjoy your seat. How lovely. Well, 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 spare a thought for all the Buffy boys. Well, that is super. That, thank you very, very much. Well, if you'd like to take a seat, we should thank Barry. Thank I mean, I love that thought. So thank you for a lovely, lovely job. It's great. My pleasure. You also said something else to me, David, that struck a chord, that you like fudge. Yeah, I do, I I'm like. afraid. Well, that's all right. And you said that you was restricted to three pieces. Yes, I was. So no. it's three pieces, mate, and no more. <laughs> Well, how lovely. Thank you. Three pieces and, and no, no more. more. No. OK. That is super. Thank you very, very well, much. OK, well, enjoy your bench. I shall, and I'm sure many, many people will enjoy this bench, and it will bring many memories. And thank you, young Mothy Boys, <laughs> and all. <laughs> Anybody for some fudge? Oh, Go on, have some fudge. Thank you, Christine. We could start a tradition. End of day fudge eating mm. sessions. The bench is a lasting tribute to David's forebears, who helped to make Paris what it is today, and the perfect spot to enjoy the gardens for the next hundred years. I love this. I seriously love this. It's beautiful, just absolutely beautiful. It's amazing how gardens can plot moments in human history. And what with Powys, the Land Girls and the Dingle, I've seen a new garden story here in Mid Wales. From the heyday of Edwardian country life to the nation at war, and post-war life on the land. A personal relationship with the soil has left an indelible mark on the land below me.